U.S. Navy History, arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I am joined by His Excellency, the XO, Stephen. Hey there, everyone. How's it going? So, today we are going to pick back up in the Eastern Theater of Operations in the American Civil War. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the Fredericksburg and Chancellorville area of operations. Now, there's no naval battles, so we're just going to talk about it just briefly and then move on. All right. So, are you ready to get underway? Let's cast off. So, uh, this is November 7th, 1862. And President Lincoln relieves the moron McClellan of his command because he did not pursue Lee when Lee retreated from Sharpsburg. That certainly took long enough. Oh, I mean, he's already been given his job back once. <laughs> Let's see if it happens again. Now, Burnside, even though he did not give much of a performance as the core commander of Antium, he was given the command of the Army of the Potomac, which was, you know, McKellen's command. And then Lincoln goes ahead and he pressures him to, you know, attack as quickly as you can. We need to go after the bastards. Birdside does, he, he rises to the occasion and he plans to drive south towards Richmond. What he wanted to do was outflank Robert E. Lee by going across the Rappahannock River very quickly to get to Fredericksburg and placing himself between the Confederate Army and their capital. So there were some administrative problems, as, you know, there always is in wartime. And this prevented pontoon bridging boats from getting there when they were supposed to. And this forced him to wade his troops across the river, which gave Lee more time to fortify a defensive line on the heights behind the city. So after getting across and probably, you know, letting his troops dry, he launches a massive frontal assault against Lee's left flank at Mary's Heights. Now, uh, he also then sends his, an attack against his right flank, which was able to briefly break through Jackson's line. But because there was, of course, a misunderstanding, as there always seems to be, he continued to pound the most fortified parts of the heights because he thought that this would enable his troops opposite of Jackson to exploit a advantage. So the Union, they lost over 12,000 men that day, and the Confederacy lost approximately 4,500. Despite, you know, this horrific defeat and the utter dismay that was felt in Washington, Burnside was not fired. They kept him. I mean, he lost three more men than that battle than the Confederates lost. How, how is that a good performance worthy of keeping him? Three. You said 12, I thought, to 45 or so. Yeah. How how is that three more men? Three times. Oh, okay. You did you left out the times. I thought you were saying three individuals. No, 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 no. Oh. This is that new math, you know, where we uh substitute some numbers, swap <laughs> it around a little bit to get a result that sounds a little better. Gotcha. That sounded better. Three instead of three times. I I'll, I'll give you that. So Burnside, he plans to resume his offensive north of Fredericksburg. But, you know, things ensue. Capers went awry. And 
in January 1863, he suffered the humiliation of the Mud March. Real quick, this was pretty much a aborted winter offensive attempt. But, you know, go talk to the U.S. Army history podcast to learn more about that. <laughs> so after this... A group of his underlings made it clear to Lincoln that Burnside was even worse than McLennan. And so one of these guys, a Major General Joseph Hooker, was given command of the Army of the Potomac on January 26th of 1863. So, you know, Burnside lasted even less time than... McLennan did. Now, Hooker, he actually has a very good record as a corps commander in, you know, campaigns that he had been in previously. And he spent the rest of the winter reorganizing and resupplying this oh. army. And he also paid special attention to the health and morale issues of his men. Now, He's also known for being aggressive. So he planned a very complex campaign against Robert E. Lee to be launched in the spring. So both of the armies, they remained in their positions around Fredericksburg. And Hooker planned to send his cavalry very deep into the Confederate rear because he wanted to disrupt their supply lines. You know, as we've learned, yeah, no supplies equals no army. No army fights on an empty stomach. Or without bullets. Well, back in my day, we fought with two sticks and a rock, and we had to share the rock. So one would, one would throw it, and the other one would go fetch it and throw it back? Or how, how does that work? You throw it, and then, yeah, the other guy finds the rock that you threw and brings it back, and then, you know, your thrower throws it again. It's a very efficient system. Wow. Yeah, except the guy's going into enemy lines to retrieve the well, rock. Well, the rock took out the guy that would be taking out your retriever. Well, what about the guys around that guy? That's why he has a stick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, to support this cavalry uh, detachment, the he sent a corps to keep Lee's attention at Fredericksburg. And they, he also sent more of his men to make a flanking maneuver. This was supposed to be very stealthy. And this would actually put the bulk of the Army of the Potomac behind Lee. So, you know, trying to catch him in a vice and just push and squeeze. All right. Lee, he had actually been overconfident and he sent a detachment of his army to forage in southern Virginia which means he was now out month he was now outnumbered 57,000 to 97,000 yeah now the plan that hooker put in place and started implementing was doing very well and the bulk of his army crossed the river and was in position on May 1st. Now, that's when things turned a bit. You know, here comes the big but. There was a minor contact with the enemy. And Hooker, he begins losing confidence. And instead of striking the Northern Virginia army, in the rear, as, you know, he had planned, he withdrew and made a defensive perimeter around Chancellorsville. So a little skirmish caused him to change his entire plan. Yes, I think the Army of the Potomac may be cursed. Right now, yes. So Robert E. Lee seeing this, he, well, it's said that this is the boldest maneuver of the war. See, he's already split his army to address both of Hooker's attack wings. And so he split it again. 
he sent 20,000 men under Stonewall Jackson on a very long flanking maneuver to attack Hooker's right flank, which was unprotected. Jackson amazingly achieved pretty much complete surprise and routed the right flank. Now, following this, Jackson was mortally wounded by friendly fire oh. while he was scouting in front of his army. And and this is where uh, they lost what some consider their best general. Yeah. So, Lee, he keeps pounding the Chancellorville defensive line with a lot of assaults. And they were very costly assaults. And the Union Corps under Major General John Sedwick, finally did what Burnside could not. He successfully assaulted and reduced the forces on Mary's Heights in Fredericksburg and then started moving west again, threatening, you know, Lee's rear. Now, to Lee's credit, he was able to deal with both wings of the Army of the Potomac, keeping Hooker who was, like, in shock, like, what the hell happened? <laughs> in a defensive posture. And he dispatches a division to deal with Sedwick's approach that, you know, is coming. But by May 7th, Hooker, he just withdraws all of his forces north of the Rappahannock. This was a victory for Lee, a very expensive victory for He lost... 13,000 Holy men. goodness gracious. Yeah, this equal to about 25% of his army. And Hooker, he lost 17,000. But because of the different sizes, this was a lower casualty rate. So that is Fredericksburg and Chancellorville. What you thinking? Ah, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, both sides were idiots at various points. Yes. Yeah, you know, I think the Army of the Potomac is cursed. I mean, on one hand, the Confederates shot one of their best generals. On the other hand, yeah, Army of the Potomac definitely has somebody trying to mess with them that is uh, knowing more than what the enemy generals do. Like, hey, here's a field of mud. Yeah. Oh, hey, you know, here's a commanding officer that gets skittish. From a bit of uh, scouts engaging each other. And here's a new commanding officer that got fired not very long afterwards. And then here's a third one. He's aggressive, and now he's a coward. <laughs> all right, so we're going to move on to Gettysburg, or Gettysburg and all the maneuvering they did in the fall of 1863. So Robert E. Lee, he decided he wanted to capitalize on his victory that we just discussed. And to do this, he wanted to repeat his strategy of the previous year by once again invading the North. He also wanted to resupply his army and to give the farmers behind him a respite from the war. Give, give them a little rest. And of course, you know, he wanted to threaten the morale of the Northern civilians. And he was looking at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Baltimore, Maryland, and saying, both those cities look pretty good. I wonder if I could take one. Both of those are fairly past where the uh, line is, so to speak. How was he intending on getting up there? By being Lee? Yeah, fair enough. By invading? Fair enough. <laughs> now, Jefferson Davis, you remember who he yep. is, right? Who's he? The President of the Confederate States. There you go. Hey, I got to I got to test you every <laughs> once in a while, make sure you're paying attention. Uh he agreed on Lee's strategy. He did so reluctantly, but he did. And one of the reasons he did was because he was concerned about the fate of Vicksburg in Mississippi. The river fortress there was being threatened by Grant. So, you know, poor old Jackson, he's shot in the back by his own guys. Lee decided to reorganize his army into three corps. He puts in charge Lieutenant Generals James Longstreet, Richard S. 
Ewell and A.P. Hill. And then he begins moving his army northwest from Fredericksburg into the Shenandoah Valley. This is... He was hoping that the Blue Ridge Mountains would screen their northward movements. So he was going to sneak in. Mm, yes, be very, very quiet. It's army sneaking season. Now, Hooker, he is, surprisingly enough, still in command. He sends some cavalry to find Lee. And on June 9th, the Battle of Brandy Station. Well, I mean, it's more of a clash, but I mean, it counts, right? <laughs> yeah. This ended up being the largest, mostly cavalry battle of the war. But it ended up a draw. When this happened, Hooker, see, he goes, there they are. Everybody, go towards them. And they start pursuing. And they start pursuing for weeks. And while they're pursuing, Hooker's going to be arguing with both Lincoln and Halleck over the role of the garrison at Harper's Ferry. And because of all of this, President Lincoln, he's like, you are no better than McLennan. You are fired. <laughs> and he replaced him with Major General George G. Meade. So General Meade, he meets up with Hooker, and they look and review, you know, the field of battle, where his army is and where Lee's army is. And Meade orders the army to advance into southern Pennsylvania in a very wide front. His intention was to protect Washington and Baltimore and to find the elusive Lee, because he disappeared again. He also makes plans to put a defensive line behind Pipe Creek in northern Maryland, in just in case he could not find some good ground in Pennsylvania to fight a battle that he you know, would have advantages. And now Lee, he's sitting there and he's watching all this and he's like, holy crap, look at the move so quickly. <laughs> they are like running. Why can't my guys move like that? Yeah. So he crosses the Potomac and enters into Frederick in Maryland. And his troops were spread out over a considerable distance in Pennsylvania. So he sends his cavalry and a engages in a raid around the eastern flank of the Union Army. And because of this, he was not in touch with headquarters, which made Lee blind to where his enemy was and what they were doing. They're probably that way-ish. Yeah, maybe they're over there. Um, but I smell something over there. Oh, no, that guy just farted. So he decided that just like in his Maryland campaign, he's going to have to concentrate his army before he could be defeated. So he orders all of his units to move into the general vicinity of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. So, the Battle of Gettysburg is considered to be the turning point of the war. Meade actually defeats Lee in a three-day battle fought by 160,000 soldiers in total. And in total, there were 51,000 casualties. The battle started... On the morning of July 1st, when a couple of brigades clashed with some cavalry, and then more troops arrive, and, you know, there's fighting over who's going to take up the high ground south of the town, and then the next day, Lee launches a massive pair of assaults against the left and right flanks of Meade's army. So this makes a fierce battle just everywhere it covered the little round top the devil's den the wheat field the peach orchard east cemetery hill 
Colops Hill. I mean, this is just a massive area. Well, I've never been to Gettysburg myself. From what I understand, like, they fought pretty much over several miles, right? Yeah, I, this is just a massive area of a, of, of a battle. This is huge. Um, yeah, we're talking 20 miles north to east and about 30 miles north to west, vaguely, as, as, a, as a quick uh, measurement with my fingers on the map. Okay, so definitely one of the larger, not only in number of men, but in, you know, the area of operations. Yeah. I mean, everybody's also moving. It's not, you know, all, what is it, 50 square miles at the same time. It, everything's moving, you know. But yeah, this battle just covers a massive amount of areas. So me, he's able to shift his defenders along the interior lines and they repulse the advances that Lee's Confederates were making. And on the third, that's when Lee launches the Pickett's charge against the center of the Union Army. And about three divisions were slaughtered, just taken out. This is the part of uh, the movie where the general returns to Lee and Lee's like, you know, General, where's your division? I have no division, right? I think so, yeah. Uh, at this time, Stuart, he also fights a cavalry duel east of the main lines because he was attempting to flank the Union and attack from the rear. Now, when you, when you say cavalry duel, what I want to envision is, you know, Americans jousting with one another. But that, that's not what's going on, is it? No, there, there's no jousting. There's rifles. Mm. Oh, okay, so it, it's kind of like jousting. You got a long stick still, and you are shooting something pointy. Yeah, you're shooting something pointy. You're just not jabbing your long stick into the other person. It's just like jousting. <laughs> okay. So on the fourth, both armies, they pretty much just stayed right where they were. And this is when Lee, he decides he's going to retreat back across the Potomac to Virginia. And, of course, as in every general before Meade, his pursuit was very unsuccessful and very hesitant. So he then receives a lot of criticism from Lincoln because they were like, if you would have pursued and just wiped Lee's army out, could have been the end of the war. So in October, Meade detached a portion of his army and to go to the Western Theater. And Lee looks at this and says, you know what? They're smaller now. I can take them. And then I can go and threaten Washington, which this resulted in the Bristow campaign. And it ended with Lee once again retreating you know, completely failing. Lincoln then told Meade, dude, get your stuff together. I got one more offensive campaign for you. And this happened in the fall of 1863 called the Mine Run Campaign. But unfortunately, Lee was able to cut off the advance and he constructed breastworks. Meade looked around and said, you know what? No. Guys, let's go back to our winter camp. That's a very defensible position. I don't want to inflict excessive casualties. So, you know, again, he was put in because he was aggressive, and then he got turned into a coward by the Army of the Potomac, apparently. <laughs> well, maybe McClellan uh, cursed the Army of the Potomac to constantly get cold feet. Yeah, he might have. It might be all McClellan's fault. You know, blame McKellen. I'll get a song made for you. Okay. So that's going to bring us to Grant versus Lee between the 1864 and 65. So this is March 1864, and Ulysses S. Grant is promoted to lieutenant general, and he is put in charge of all Union armies. So he sits back and thinks for a little bit, 
to put together a strategy to put pressure on the Confederacy from as many areas he could do at one time, which is what President Lincoln has been trying to get everybody to do from the beginning. <laughs> Grant, he puts General Sherman in command of all of the forces west and moves his headquarters to be with the Army of the Potomac. Dude, stay away from them, please. It's fine. It's fine. Totally got this. Hold my beer. Okay. Yeah. So he moves to Virginia. And he intended to attempt to maneuver Lee into a place where they can have a decisive battle. He also had a secondary objective, which was to capture Richmond. But Grant knew that that it was going to be pretty much an automatic capture once Lee was destroyed. So his strategy called for a coordinated attack from Grant's army and Meade's army to attack Lee from the north. Let me guess. They didn't coordinate the best. Well, we'll get there where there's still more coordination to get into. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give spoilers. Oh, no spoilers. I mean, it's only been... 160 years. What? 160 years? Yeah. uh, we're, We're still not... Under the grace, we're still under the grace period. We cannot do spoilers. So Grant tells Benjamin Butler to go towards Richmond from the southeast and Franz Siegel to control the Shenandoah Valley. Sherman was to invade Georgia to defeat Joseph E. Johnston and to capture Atlanta. And George Cook and William W. Averill was to go against the railroad supply lines in West Virginia, while Nathaniel Banks was to capture Mobile, Alabama. So that's a lot of coordinated attacks. Especially back in the day when communicating with anybody who wasn't in your immediate army involved either a bird you hope flies in the right direction, a guy on a horse you hope doesn't get shot down, with the message being intercepted to boot, or I don't know, did they use smoke signals during this time? Not the Americans. That was mostly Native Americans. Okay, so you have a guy on a horse or a bird, and you have to hope that either don't get shot down with the message intercepted in the process. Yeah. Pretty much. So, of course, as you can surmise, most of these initiatives failed. Too many moving parts, plans don't survive contact with the enemy. But a lot of these failures was because of the... was because of political reasons rather than military reasons. I'm sorry, what? Because these generals were assigned to their area of operations politically instead of militarily. Oh. Ah, yeah, Joe Schmo, you you seem really popular with the folks down in Tennessee. Head on down. Yeah. So Butler's army got bogged down against, you know, pretty much inferior forces under Beauregard. Sigel was completely defeated at the Battle of New Market and was then replaced by a Mr. David Hunter. Banks was distracted and failed to move on mobile. Now, Crooks and Averill were able to cut the rail lines between Virginia and Tennessee. And Sherman Atlanta attack was successful, although it lasted a very long time. It went through the fall. Hmm. So let's go back to the Army of Potomac, you know, the cursed yeah. army. Let's let's mosey on down. So in early May, they crossed the Rapidan River and entered a area that was at that time called the Wilderness of Spotsylvania. 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 There we go. <laughs> and Robert 
Elite actually surprises Grant and Meade with an aggressive assault. So this made it the two-day battle of the wilderness and was inconclusive. I mean, you're fighting over a random neck of the woods, according to the title of the battle. I don't think anybody wants to commit too many forces. Hmm. So, both sides suffered a lot of damage. Lots of casualties. They really wanted that random neck of the woods, then. Yes, they did. But, Grant does not retreat after the battle. You know, like McLennan, Meade, the third guy. <laughs> He he has this crazy concept of like what if we what if we stayed, yeah, and he sends his army to the southeast to attempt to maneuver to keep Lee on the defensive through a number of bloody battles and moved closer to Richmond. Grant knows the size of his army and that he has a larger army and that he had a base of manpower north of him that was be able to sustain a war of attrition better than Lee and his confederacy can do. So even though Grant suffers approximately 55,000 casualties during the campaign, Lee lost, percentage-wise, a lot higher. And these guys could not be replaced. So, in the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, Lee is able to beat Grant to the crossroads of the town and establish a defensive line. A very strong defensive line. And in a series of attacks covering about two weeks, Grant just hammers away at the lines. Mostly centering on the area known as the mule shoe as compared to the area known as the horseshoe or the camel shoe i don't know what other animals wear shoes dogs but i don't think dog booties have been invented at that point people mm, i think they were boots still at this point excuse me good sir how doth thy like those jordans swoosh <laughs> So there is a massive assault that Hancock did on the Bloody Angel portion of the line on the 12th. And this foreshadowed some tactics that would be employed in World War I to break through the trenches. So Grant once again disengages and then slips to the southeast. Lee sees this coming and intercepts Grant and f puts his forces behind the North Anne River to force Grant to divide his army to attack it. Lee has the opportunity to defeat Grant, but fails to attack the way he needs to to bring this trap. Probably because he got sick. Yeah, it is hard to lead an army when you're feeling a little under the weather. Or praying to the porcelain god. Yeah. The porcelain god didn't exist back then. It was a hole oh, in the ground. Oh, oh, the, uh, the outhouse god. Yeah. So Grant looks and says, we're not doing a frontal assault. That's going to be very costly. And so he's like you know what, maybe we need to just go around to his left flank. And he starts moving and then goes, you know what, let's just keep moving southeast instead. So the 31st comes around and the Union Cavalry, they capture a vital crossroad of Old Cold Harbor. While the Confederacy, they come in from Richmond from the Totopanomi Creek lines. And then on the 1st, the Union reaches Cold Harbor and they assault the Confederate works and they do achieve some successes. By the next day, both armies were on the field 
forming pretty much a seven mile long front. And on dawn of the third, they assaulted the lines and pretty much were slaughtered at all points in the Battle of Cold Harbor. Grant lost over 12,000 men in the battle. Wow. And yeah. And the northern newspapers thereafter referred to him as a butcher. So the 12th comes around, evening time, and Grant decides to again advance by his left flank and marches to the James River. He was able to hide what he was doing from Lee, and his army crosses the river on a bridge of pontoon boats which stretched over 2,100 feet. That's a lot of boats. Yeah. Now, Lee was afraid that Grant would force him into a siege of the city. And this is what was looking like was about to occur. So Grant, he makes a different decision. And he was like, there's a more efficient way to get Richmond and Lee. So a few miles south of Petersburg, there were crucial rail lines that were supplying the capital. And he was like, if I could take that, Richmond's mine. Yeah. But, you know, Butler, that was his job. <laughs> and he didn't do it. Oh, no. And... The other one, and when the Beauregard defeated the portion that came after him, this allowed Lee's army to get to Petersburg and erect defenses. So Grant was like, siege it is. So the siege starts, and Burnside was like, you know what? I got an idea. And he starts mining a tunnel under the Confederate lines. Oh, we're getting to some positive uh, siege tactics there. Yeah. They bring in explosives. They put the gunpowder fl fuse. As you do in the movies. Yep, and lights it. And it detonates, making a crater 135 feet in diameter. Oh. Yeah. How much gunpowder was in there? Enough that this crater is still there today. Enough that 350 Confederate soldiers are killed instantly. But despite this, the lengthy, bloody Battle of the Crater, as it ended up being called, ended up being a Confederate victory. Oh. At least their defensive works were messed up? Not enough, because... Fall comes, the winter comes, both armies construct trenches spanning more than 30 miles, and the Union, they attempt to get around the right flank of the Confederate line and destroy their supply lines. And even though, you know, this siege is happening... The, the civilians on the northern side didn't really get that big of a morale hit because of Sherman capturing Atlanta. Yeah, Sherman's march uh, across Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. And because of all this, this pretty much said to everybody, hey. We're winning. We can fight this to the end with, you know, an actual surrender and not just a stalemate. All right. So that is Grant versus Lee. <laughs> <laughs> it took a year and change. There were some explosions. There were some woods. We laughed. We cried. We lost 10 pounds. Yeah. So that is going to be it for this episode. So once again, we are going to honor one of our fallen angels with our partnership with HeroCards.us. So today we are honoring Leonard Roy Harmon. He was a mess attendant, first class. He was 
His hometown was Curo, Texas. He was assigned to the USS San Francisco CA-38. He received the Navy Cross and Purple Heart. His date of sacrifice was November 13th, 1942. Killed in action north of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. He was 25 years old. So, Leonard Harmon was born to Cornelius and Juanita Harmon in Cuero, Texas. This is a small town southeast of San Antonio on January 21st, 1917. He graduated from Dole High School at the height of the Great Depression, but he was able to find some work doing chores for the William Frobis House, which is a his local historical property. Hmm. In December of 1937, he and his wife, Elaine Ross, welcomed a baby boy. Two years later, in July of 39, Harmon travels to Houston and enlists in the U.S. Navy. He is then sent for training in Norfolk, Virginia, and he's assigned to the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco, CA-38, on October 28, 1939. So during the late 30s and 40s, the Navy, along with, you know, all U.S. military branches, they were strictly segregated, which means people of color were offered very few opportunities for advancement. So Harmon was trained as a mess attendant, which was one of the few duties available. And like most members of a naval crew, he was also trained in damage control because everybody is trained in damage control and firefighting. Well, at least now for firefighting, I don't know about back then. And he was assigned a battle station aboard the heavy cruiser, as everyone is. So the San Francisco is deployed to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, and while at sea, Harmon was promoted to mess attendant first class. So he became an E6 really quickly. So that's a credit to him, I think. But on November 12th, 1942, in the waters between Guadalcanal and the small Savo Islands, the San Francisco is attacked by a Japanese aerial assault, which this starts the... Naval Battle of Guadalcanal. The San Francisco is one of the warships protecting transports of marine reinforcements landing on Guadalcanal. The pilot of a badly damaged Japanese plane deliberately crashes into the San Francisco's radar and fire control stations, killing or hurting 50 men. Enemy gunfire also killed almost every officer on the bridge. And without regard for his own safety, Harmon puts himself at great risk to evacuate the wounded to a dressing station. And he was killed while shielding a wounded shipmate from gunfire with his own body. According to naval records, 77 men were killed on the USS San Francisco during the Battle of Guadalcanal. 105 were injured and 7 are missing. The ship was hit 45 times and had 22 fires that had to be extinguished. Oh my. So for his extraordinary heroism under fire, Leonard Harmon was posthumously awarded the Navy Cross. The citation reads as follows. The President of the United States of America takes pride in presenting the Navy Cross posthumously to mess attendant first class Leonard Roy Harmon. Naval serial number 3600418, United States Navy, for extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty in action against the enemy while serving on board the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco CA-38. During action against enemy Japanese naval forces near Savo Island on the Solomon Islands on the night of 12 to 13 November 1942. With persistent disregard of his own personal safety, Mess Attendant First Class Harmon rendered invaluable assistance in caring for the wounded and assisting them to a dressing station. In addition to displaying unusual loyalty on behalf of the injured executive officer, he deliberately exposed himself to hostile gunfire in order to protect a shipmate and, as a result of this courageous deed, was killed in action. 
His heroic spirit of self-sacrifice, maintained above and beyond the call of duty, was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Buried at sea, Leonard Roy Harmon is memorialized on the walls of the missing in Manila American Cemetery in the Philippines. And on May 21st, 1943, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox announced that a destroyer escort, the USS Harmon, DE-678 would be named in Leonard's honor. The ship was launched on July 25th, 1943, and was the first U.S. warship to be named for a African-American. Other honors included the dedication of Harmon Hall, which is a enlisted sailor's quarters at the U.S. Naval Air Station in North Island, California, on July 29th, 1975. And a state historical marker was de dedicated in 1977 at Curo Municipal Park in Texas. And the street on the north edge of the park was renamed Leonard Roy Harmon Drive. There's also a poster of Harmon hanging in the Smithsonian Institute's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. So, Leonard Roy Harmon, thank you. All right, XO, you want to take us out? We hope you enjoyed this episode of the U.S. Navy History Podcast. If you did... Please feel free to leave us a rating on your listening app of choice and perhaps even leave a comment. If you'd like, we can read it on the air. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so using the email usnavyhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Twitter hasn't burned down quite yet as of this recording, so you can still tweet at us using the handle at usnhistorypod. We do have a Discord server that's linked in the show notes. If you want to engage with us more directly, come on down. We'd love to hear from you. And as always, we wish you fair winds and following seas. Until next episode, folks. Goodbye, everybody. U.S. Naval History Podcast. Departing. Departing.